Okay, so let's really talk about uh, the difference between, uh, like I think Rob, uh, like could you explain in your mind, how do you see the difference between continuous availability and resilience, right? People use these terms interchangeably, but if, is there a difference between the two? Yeah, yeah, um, it's a good question. I, I think there is a difference, it's a nuanced one, but I like to think about availability as a measure of the uptime of your system. So, you know, what percentage of the time is your system able to continuously serve requests? Um, you know, this means like even in the face of planned or unplanned uh, events like uh, node outage or a software upgrade. Um, but resilience refers to a, a slightly different property to me. It's, it's more about, you know, the ability of a system to, to heal or self-correct in the event of unexpected uh, events, like a permanent node failure, prolonged network partition, um, you know, maybe your system has immediate failover capability, but uh, what is it doing in the background to ensure that the, the failover is, is also sort of um, uh, resilient, you know, not, not um, becoming more fragile to, to other failures? Um, is it, how is it rebalancing itself? How is it uh, ensuring that uh, other replicas are are put into place uh, after a certain amount of time. Okay, got it, got it. So, so um, I guess in a nutshell, right? Availability is like a superset concept that makes sure everything is always running, and it's like uh, you really don't experience anything. And and resilience is more, I guess, under the hood, right? Like, whereas if something goes wrong, you go fix it, and you're able to, you're 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 now ready to take on more failures, or you know, the the current failures in fact did not uh, affect you as much, right? Okay, great. So maybe we can talk about those two independently, but let's start with the lower, like uh, let's start with the higher level thing, right? Like how does Yugabyte DB achieve uh, high availability and resilience, right? And, and doing that without sacrificing consistency, because typically in relational databases, you use asynchronous replication, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure you achieve some of this. And there you start losing data, right? So how does Yugabyte DB do that? Yeah, so great question. Um, let, let me see. I, I actually have some slides. Um, Great. And, and that, while, that'll help me tell the story. Yeah. While Rob is pulling up the slides, folks, uh, you can feel free to ask us questions right now live, or you can join our Slack channel, yugabyte.com forward slash Slack, and you know, go to the YFTT channel there to ask us questions. But, anyways, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just start by saying, um, you know, one, one important note if you're not already familiar, uh, Yugabyte. DB separates your data into tablets. So these are like logical chunks of, of a table or uh, shards of a table um, or partitions of a table, sorry. Um, and, and then with those tablets, we, we replicate uh, the partitions uh, across, uh, you know, typically we might see three nodes. And we do this using uh, the RAF consensus algorithm. Uh, this has a lot of nice properties, uh, which we'll definitely go into more over this discussion. But one of the most important ones is that it gives us per row uh, consistency uh, in terms of uh, adding operations uh, across nodes and replicating them. Um, and, and the details of it are very interesting, uh, very, very complex. But, um, you know, if you want to read more about that, check out our blog. We have a, a few great articles on the subject. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, typically when we have this, this replicated structure of tablets, uh, you can see in this picture, uh, let's look at like this yellow tablet here. Uh, one of them will be the, the leader. And uh, the leader is, is solely responsible for serving uh, reads and writes. Um, and the nice thing uh, about having this uh, replicated sort of uh, configuration is that if for any reason this node two dies, we can very quickly fail over to node one or node three, which have uh, one of which should have a very up-to-date, uh, a, a perfectly consistent um, representation of the data that was at the leader. Um, and you know, typically we will try to uh, distribute these replicas across availability zones to, to decrease uh, the chance of multiple nodes um, for a given uh, tablet multiple replicas for a given tablet uh, becoming unavailable. Um, and and uh, just in terms of availability, uh, you know, we, we were able to fail over in, in Raft uh, within three seconds. So Raft has a uh, leader election protocol that uh, as soon as uh, one of the replicas is detected as uh, unavailable, 
Uh, the other two will determine which of it is going to become the new leader. And, and this typically completes within three seconds. So, you know, very quick. And um, this, along with some uh, intelligence uh, in the client uh, to, to retry these requests at the new leader, allows us to, to basically transparently fill over uh, to, to a, an available replica in case a node does fail. Great, awesome, awesome. So uh, I guess to recap here on the failure, it's about three seconds for the failed nodes worth of data to you know to come online and get serving. And so you know, in the application side, it just looks like a higher latency event, right? Like as opposed to an unavailability event, in, in which would happen if it takes much longer, right? Um, okay. So and in that sense, it's a it's still a CP database, but the availability is pretty high because it's just a, a three second blip, right? Um, so, okay, great. So uh, let's, I mean, I think you implicitly covered it, but it'd be good to talk about it explicitly. Uh, you know, folks, a lot of folks deploy Unibyte DB, uh, they start with a multi-zone deployment or a multi-easy deployment where you can su survive not just the failure of a node, but a failure of a zone as well. And obviously you can generalize this to a multi-region deployment, right? So can you talk about how a multi-zone deployment looks like? Yeah, definitely. So um, let's, Let's talk about, uh, I, I have this picture. This is sort of a typical uh, deployment you might imagine uh, across three zones. Um, you, you see in each zone you have um, three nodes. Uh, this cluster is uh, running replication factor three, which means every partition of your database has three replicas. Um, and in general, we will, you know, we have this load balancer process uh, running separately and, and sort of um, aware of, of the topology of the cluster, as well as you know what tablets are being hosted where. And that load balancer will try to ensure a few properties are, are met um, for the placement of these replicas. Uh, for one, for a given tablet, you know we want um, each of the replicas to be across different zones. Uh, this is just to you know reduce the, the chance of, of uh, multiple failures for a given tablet. Um, also, we want each node to have roughly the same amount of uh, leaders. Uh, you know, this this means uh, a node is serving about um, is serving traffic for each leader. So we want each node to serve roughly the same amount of traffic. Uh, you know, assuming the the nodes are heterogeneous, um, and you know, we want each node to have roughly the same number of followers because um, follower replicas also lead to uh, bigger storage footprint. So. Uh, yeah, we, we would have this type of, uh, you know, multi-zone uh, deployment and we would sort of distribute the, the replicas of each tablet um, to be as resilient as possible. Got it, got it. So uh, there's a question um, that Tom has, which is uh, how fast does the data replicate from the leader to the other nodes? But, you know, while answering that, I think it'll also be good for you to answer Rob, what happens if one of the node in a zone fails, right? Like, where does it replicate data? Like, because, you know, we, I, I believe there are some constraints here which say that you need to have one copy of the data per zone, and that's the only way you can survive a zone failure. But what happens if that copy of data in a particular zone fails? Like, so let's cover both where it replicates it to and how does it ensure the constraints are met, like, or continue to remain satisfied, as well as how quickly it uh, replicates. Yeah, great. So uh, in general, when um, when we're receiving rights to a tablet, and uh, by the way, these rights are coming sort of from from the query layer, so not directly from you know your user application. That talks to our query layer. Our query layer talks to these tablets, um, and the tablet, uh, upon receiving, let's say, a write request, uh, will replicate if it's a RF three cluster uh, to its two followers. Um, and as soon as one of those followers responds, uh, the tablet will return to the client. This, you know, typically is the, you know, low single digit millisecond, like one, two millisecond type uh, latency operation. Um, and so that, um, you know, as soon as we are able to uh, receive an acknowledgement from one of the followers that this operation was replicated, the tablet leader can comfortably respond to the client knowing that if it fails, um, at least one of the nodes is up to date. Uh, and so when that failure happens, uh, let's say, you know, node four fails, uh, node two and node seven, and we're still talking about this uh, yellow tablet here, 
node two and node seven will communicate with each other and determine, okay, are we both up to date? Um, if so, you know, one of us is a leader is sort of arbitrary. Otherwise, you know, whoever is the most up to date um, becomes a leader. And, and because of the properties of RAP, it's guaranteed that the, at least one of them is as up to date as the tablet leader was uh, before it crashed. Um, so I don't know if that perfectly answers the, the second yeah, part and, of that question. Yeah, and uh, if uh, on a failure, right, what is the time window to initiate replication? Like, is that configurable? What, what, like, what is the time window after which a node is deemed as not coming back, so you need to re-replicate data? Ah, uh, yeah, so that is, um, basically, we, we have this mechanism whereby all, all of the, the follower replicas uh, will expect to receive a heartbeat from the leader. This is um, you know, something that happens either in the course of uh, normal operations being replicated or if nothing's being replicated, the leader will just say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm still here. No need to elect a new leader. Um, and if they don't hear from the leader within a second, uh, they will initiate an election. Um, this, this threshold is, is configurable, but we find that a second works pretty well by default. And um, one of the nodes, uh, either of the nodes, maybe both of the nodes will, will initiate this election and they will um, arrive uh, at, a, at a consensus about who will be the next leader um, once they've initiated that election. Got it, got it. And uh, there's another question about if a follower replica dies and doesn't come back, then we'd have to spin up a new replica to take its place. Is that disruptive in any way? And if so, what disruption, how long, right? So what happens to the follower replicas, the impact of an algorithm? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I have another slide here that I think will help gotcha. me illustrate that actually, question. Actually, you know what? Let's just look at how a node or a zone failure works in practice. Maybe that might just help, right? Like, let's just go through, um, like, how it fails, and then we can, maybe that'll answer the question of, you know, what happens if a follower replica fails. Yeah, great. Great. So, um, yeah, actually, I did talk about a, a good chunk of this, um, but, um, you know, when when we see, so when we see this, this tablet leader fail, uh, we uh, will, within seconds, initiate this election. So, let's say in this example, node two becomes the leader. Um, one thing um, I mentioned here, I, this is a bit of a callback uh, to, to an earlier uh, discussion point, but at our query layer, we, we have this, this architecture where you know, the application can talk to any Postgres process. It's all stateless and, and Postgres, uh, you know, this is our, our version of Postgres, highly modified uh, to, to work with um, DocDB and, and uh, DocDBs are sort of document serving layer and, and post the, the query layer can talk to any T server, which is, is serving the DocDB layer. And, and so if one of these uh, servers does fail, uh, the query layer, let's say this, this process right here sees that this one fails, it can um, very quickly determine that the new leader is over here and retry its request. Um, so I just wanted to show that picture um, and let's see. So, uh, I guess there, there are sort of two things. Um, one, one thing to note is that the election is the raft election and the election of a new leader is our mechanism for immediate failover so that we, uh, continue to be available immediately. Um, but, but right after that, we, uh, you know, that failover might happen in a way that uh, produces an imbalance of leaders uh, across nodes, across zones. So uh, our load balancer will actually kick in at that point and um, force uh, re-election to, to happen in such a way that the cluster ends up balanced. And then um, finally getting to, uh, let's see, uh, I think the question was, was more about like what happens if if uh, this node never comes back, right? Yeah, um, there were two. Yeah, that was one question. If the node never comes back, and another question was, uh, you know, what happens if a follower fails? But I think from your description, it's pretty clear. When a follower fails, nothing really happens, right? Like because you have another follower and the current leader, and they just continue to take reads and writes, and the follow and the follower is simply replaced in the background, right? So only impact mm -hmm. to the leader shards actually have an impact. Follower shards don't, right? Um, but right. so that still leaves the question of what happens when uh, when a node fails. But 
But I'm thinking maybe even before we come to the, the, the resilience portion of node failure and, and rebuilding data, let's maybe quickly look at you know, um, you know, the same mechanism, like can it be used or, or, or what happens in order to ensure availability, like we're still on the availability topic, right? Where the failovers are pretty quick. How, do, how does Yugabyte DB ensure availability for some of the day two operations, right? Like software upgrades or like you know, security patches where you have to refresh the AMI or um, you know, other things, right? Like, um, uh, like say schema changes. There's a bunch of stuff that happens. So how do we ensure that it's available all the time to the end application? Yeah, great. So um, let me jump to this, uh, this picture here. So uh, I'm, I'm going to sort of walk through the example of, uh, you know, let's say we want to decommission a node. And, and I think the example kind of quickly applies to, to all the other cases. Uh, so uh, imagine we have this, uh, this setup where we have these three nodes. And for simplicity, each node only has like one tablet replica. You only have one tablet in your cluster. Um, and um, let's say we want to decommission this node on the left here. Uh, so what we can do is uh, add a new node um, to the, the raft group. So when, when, when a tablet is replicated, we call that uh, each, the, the set of replicas a raft group. Um, and there, you know, raft enables us to add members to the raft group as a uh, atomic and consistently replicated raft operation. So uh, in this in this scenario, we want to add this this node on the bottom. So now uh, this tablet has uh, four replicas uh, in the raft group, and what that allows us to do at this point is is actually remove one of them, remove the one that is hosted at the node that we want to decommission. So this is um, you know uh, once once uh, the replica is added and all of the data is replicated, we, we go on to remove this node on the left uh, with another sort of config change operation to route. And um, you know, at, once that's done, uh, the, the tablet server, the node eventually is serving no tablets, it can be decommissioned and there is no impact to the cluster at all. You'll notice you know, that the tablet leader didn't change there at all. Um, the number of nodes available for um, replication uh, never decreased. Uh, so basically, you know, no impact to any of the critical path traffic. Um, you just add, add a node uh, and then replicate data to that node and then remove another node. Got it. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, that's great. Um, uh, and, and yeah, the same thing, Any, anytime you want to even refresh the AMI on the node, spin up a new node, the same process, like as you said, can be used. It's, it's really just spike up the replication factor to four and then shift the leaders if you have to and then drop the old node, right? Like just that, repeat that process in, in, in a graceful enough manner and you, you have a application that doesn't detect what's going on, right? Um, okay, so let's talk really quickly about rebuilding data automatically on permanent node failures. Yeah, so, um... Let's say I'm going to go back to this this picture we had earlier. So, you know, this this yellow tablet again uh, fails. A uh, new leader is elected. Um, but if in the case that uh, let's do know, the new, new leader is like a yeah, the node stays down. It's not coming back, right? It's just gone. Yep. And yep. So no, it happens at three a.m. Right? Like nobody wants to wake up at three a.m. and go fix that node. So what happens in this case? Exactly. So, so node two becomes a leader. We detect, you know, node four is not coming back. Basically, right now, after 15 minutes, what we'll do is uh, initiate a process we call remote bootstrap, whereby essentially one of node two or node seven will uh, add this uh, a replica, um, or really the load balancer will will determine like it's it's time to add a replica at uh, node five. And uh, that um, that replica will be added. Um, the raft config will be changed, and you know one of node two or node seven will stream all of its data to to node five, so that node five can bootstrap a replica of this yellow node. Um, so this is uh, this is important. Um, obvi obviously, we in this picture you can see that when we bootstrap this yellow node, now node five, sorry, this yellow replica. Node five now has uh, five tablet replicas. So there is a bit of an imbalance here, but it's important to not allow node two, node seven um, to remain operating. You know, it's 3 a.m. 
Um, we don't want to wait until 9 a.m. Uh, when a, an engineer is online and, and looking at this um, to uh, you know, commission a new node to, to be able to sustain a failure node two or node seven. We want to replicate a, a replica to zone B um, immediately. So, so we end up replicating this replica to node, uh, node five. Um, and all of this is done, you know, we, we basically ship all of the encoded and, and compressed data. Um, so it, it's, it's as efficient as it can be. And, and once, once all of that data is shipped, uh, that replica comes online and it's ready to act as, a, as any other follower. Yep, great, great. And I think uh, Dennis had a clarifying question, but I think it's uh, easy enough with this to answer that, which is uh, if if a node which had a follower failed, right? Like, uh, would the re-replication, would we ever spin up the node itself, right? And I think the, the point here is we're talking about the database internals here. The spinning up of the node is not a database concern. So the best we can do is go and replicate it onto other nodes. Whereas in the cloud, we would spin up the node, right? Like that's, um, one is more of a, the managed service operational aspect, whereas the other is about the data integrity aspect built into the database itself. Right? Is that fair to say, Rob? Right. That's fair to say. And I was sort of speaking from the perspective of, you know, you're managing your own gigabyte uh, cluster and, you know, you don't, we want to make it as easy as possible if you're managing it to, to not have to deal uh, with the 3 a.m. pager. Um, but, but obviously, you know, in a, in a managed uh, service in our, in our cloud product, this, um, this is something we would definitely take care of. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So all of this is great, I think, but uh, I'm sure everybody's thinking like, how does this really work in practice? Like, uh, so maybe see yes. it in practice. So. Yeah, I, I do have a demo ready. So, um, I have this cluster here, uh, this cluster is, um, I'm running TPCC against this cluster. So it's a three node cluster. Um, each node is in, in multiple, in different, a different AZ. So I just want to show you. App. So it's a transactional app doing transactions, all of the workloads running. Okay, great. So it's doing a combination of all of that stuff across different user facing transactions, right? Okay, got it. Let's go. Exactly, okay. exactly. So yeah, you see ops here, everything's healthy. Um, I, I want to show you, okay, so first of all, this is kind of, you know, reads per, per second on each node. Uh, we have three nodes here. Um, it's, it's all roughly consistent. You can see the leaders, leadership at each node is, is roughly, roughly the same. Um, I want to show you what happens when we take a node offline. Uh, so we can kind of see, um, the nuts and bolts of what I was just talking about in action. So I'm going to go ahead and um, stop the processes at this node. So that um, it's a node failing, right? Effectively, like if the node fails. The exactly. Yep, got it. Okay. Yep. This is ex essentially killing killing the T server and and uh, master processes at that node. Um, so if we look here, we we immediately see um, the load balancer notices that the cluster is imbalanced. And um, this node suddenly has zero leaders, is serving, um, you know, this, this number is going to drive down to zero. Um, and these, these nodes are serving way more read and write, uh, reads and writes. Um, you can see that the, the leadership across these two nodes uh, became balanced very quickly. And if we look at the metrics here, just refresh these. Um, you can actually see where the load balancer kicked in. Um, yeah, right here, you can see the leader step down requests uh, start to spike right here. This is the load balancer kicking in and saying, hey, uh, failover happened, but we're imbalanced. So I need, I need some of you to, to step down um, to re-achieve balance. Um, so, yeah, this this node is still so is, is now at, stopped. Let's look, at, uh, let's look at the user facing traffic. Yeah, as as I know it's yes, safe, but yeah. So um, how do, how does that look, right? So what I guess as we said, there's like a blip in the latency, right? And the and and, and obviously that's averaged out across uh, you know a lot of transactions. So you know even though the spike may be higher, you're just seeing the average number. Right and uh, and the actual set of operations still continues. Right, there's really no disruption. Exactly. Yeah, we can see throughput is is uh, unaffected, but uh, you know the this latency, um, which is due to 
to failover is, is happening, um, which is happening transparent to to your application, um, does cause a cause a momentary blip on on the latency side. Um, you can sort of see that it's starting to to come back down. Um, uh, over the right here, we need some more data points to to see that flattening out, but. Um, yeah, the, the cluster is recovering. Each node is obviously serving more traffic than it was before, um, but uh, you know, your traffic is relatively unaffected. Fantastic. I think and this is a fully transactional lab doing all sorts of uh, you know, orders and multiple like, you know, line items and orders and so on, right? So it's, it, it really simulates a, a real world uh, relational application doing you know, relatively crazy stuff. And you know, all of this is without sacrificing any of the consistency, correct? That's right. Yep, everything is still consistent. Uh, no sacrifice there. Excellent. Okay, so um, uh, there's, I think, a couple more questions. Maybe we have time left for that. Um, I don't know if, in the meanwhile, Rob, you want to start that node that failed and show how it yes. back. So it's, it might just absolutely. Be, yeah. So while we, okay, yeah, maybe maybe we just show the rebalancing and then we go back, right? So uh, let's look at the yeah. It'll take some time. But, um, so the node is marked as unreachable. Now it's going to start coming up and it's going to rebalance itself and it's going to go back to distributing the workload across the different uh, servers, correct? Exactly. Okay, excellent. So uh, well, yeah, we can we can wait for that. So in the, in the meanwhile, let's, uh, let's talk about a couple of things and we're also running out of time here, but uh, uh, what is the overhead on the node that's still serving data to the replica while still actively serving traffic. So this is one of the concerns that many people have, right? Like if a node dies and you are, you know, you're going to replicate from the data from some node to some other node in order to bring back the replication factor, uh, then you are copying data from a node, right? Or is it one node? And uh, how does that work? Like, and really briefly, apparently we have uh, only a couple. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. As, as briefly as possible, um, you know, with the nuts and bolts of how that works is we, we ship the, the raw data from the file system uh, um, from an active replica to, to the new replica we're trying to bring up. So uh, whatever the, um, you know, uh, on disk footprint of, of that replica was, we, we now need to, to ship it across to a new uh, availability zone. Um, that all happens uh, pretty quickly. I don't have numbers off the top of my head. Um, and I, yeah, I, I don't have numbers and, in terms and, of like uh, CP uh, impact, but. And I think there's another core question, right? So when, let's say you have a 10 node cluster and one of the node dies, is the re-replication of the data lost from that node, is that happening only to one node? And is that happening only from a set of nodes? Can you talk about that also? Because that's pretty important, spreading out the uh, node, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, the, the way the load balancer um, works is that if, if you look at the the replicas that are hosted on a given node, um, the raft groups that it is a part of are also distributed relatively evenly across the cluster. So, if one node fails, uh, the the nodes that need to be re-replicated have replicas that are sort of evenly distributed across the cluster. So, so in terms of uh, the sources of, of, of the streaming of, of uh, bootstrap data, that, that is well distributed. And in terms of uh, the targets for, for where we're trying to re-bootstrap that data, um, we are trying to evenly use uh, the zone of, of the node that failed. Uh, so we will, we will try to, to bootstrap uh, all of the failed uh, replicas evenly across the remaining nodes within that zone. So, so, so basically we do the best possible yeah, job we kind of- The source of which the data comes in as well as the destination to which the data goes, but while still maintaining the constraints of placement, right? Yep, perfect. All right, awesome. Awesome. All right. Great. Thank you, folks. Uh, like, you know, you can still continue to ask Rob questions. Uh, please feel free to join our Slack, yugabyte.com forward slash Slack. And, uh, you know, just go to the YFTT channel and, you know, just feel free to ask us questions. Uh, keep the questions coming. Uh, great discussions this week. Uh, see you guys next week uh, where Neeraj and Kanan will talk about uh, smart drivers, right? Another very interesting thing we're doing to really make a distributed SQL really distributed SQL all the way to the application. All right. Thank you, folks. Thanks, folks.